<clears throat> Hello, my name is Autumn Brown, and I'm a researcher with Oklahoma State's Oklahoma Oral History Research Project. For our activism and education and the Civil Rights Movement Oral History Project, today, February 17th, 2020, I am meeting with Marilyn Looper Hildreth to discuss her experiences with school desegregation in Oklahoma City. Mrs. Hildreth, thank you so much for talking with me today. Let's just begin by telling me about yourself. Like, where were you born? A little bit about your family. I was born in Oklahoma City at the University Hospital. I lived at 316 Northeast 3rd Street. My grandmother lived at 1236 Carvel Windermere in Carverdale. And when I was a child, we could not live past 7th Street. And when I say we, I mean black people. Mm -hmm. Eventually, when Carverdale opened up, my grandparents moved out there, but we stayed on third and then moved to my Douglas High School at 1819 Northeast Park. Okay. I uh, attended elementary school at Dungy to third grade. Then I went to Truman Elementary. From Truman, I went to Webster and then to Douglas. And Webster was, we had some whites at Webster. And I was just trying to remember that. I, we did. And a lot of Mexicans. Mm -hmm. Were the, these schools segregated at that time? Partially. Okay. Partially. Okay. It was no busing or anything during that time. Because I, I think we lived about 14 blocks from the school that we had to walk every day to. Mm -hmm. When you were at Dungy, was your mother teaching there yes, at the time? Yes, well, I was out there. Okay. <laughs> um, <clears throat> can you describe the community? What was the community like when you were growing up? The Dungy community? Mm -hmm. The Dungy community was a loving community. And I didn't know that they were poor mm -hmm. because it was so much love that they had and all the activities, they were inclusive of all the kids. Yeah. And I didn't know until later on in life that we were as poor as we were. What kind of activities would you guys have? Oh, bas a lot of sports. Basketball games, they had cheerleaders, they had uh, bands, mm -hmm. name it, they had the Dungeon May Day. Yeah. You know, we had activity there known as May Day where all the kids would participate in the school. Um, what about the communities when you moved into the city, like out of Green Pastures into onto Fourth Third Street? I can remember one great thing about Third Street. We had an all well in the back of our yard. Mm -hmm. And then believe it or not, that we were not supposed to play on it, but we would figure out a way how to get on it. Uh-huh. And I don't remember a lot of people that lived on that street. Really? We had a little small house in the back of a house. Mm -hmm. And when we moved from there, we moved on Park Street. And what was the community like on Park Street? Fun. Mm -hmm. A lot of kids. And it's amazing that because it was an oil company on 10th and 10th, 10th Street that was very active during that time. And the reason I, I kind of hesitated was because we had so many kids in our neighborhood that have died. And I always wondered if the oil company might have been responsible for so many deaths of the kids. They, de they died like ash children or like they grew up and they, died they, from... All of it. They they started uh, dying like in high, high school, junior high school, and most of the majority of them are dead now. Hmm. Huh. And I just wondered about that when you asked me that question, because we had a lot of fun. We played a lot in the streets, and it, it was a loving area. Yeah. That's an interesting phenomenon with all of this um, children who passed away, though. Like, mm -hmm. It's interesting to look into. So can you tell me about your parents? 
My mother was something else. As you know, she was a teacher, and she had a unique technique technique about teaching children because she believed that all children could learn. So in our house, if you wanted to eat, you had to spell it. So that's how we learned how to spell. And you'd be surprised at what you can learn when you get hungry. We had, when a lot of kids would get a lot of toys for Christmas, we got books. Mm -hmm. She was as an extracurricular activity, she created a testing for us in math. We had to learn how to work a hundred math problems in a minute. And addition, multiplication, division, subtraction. And we got good at it when we could do it. Mm -hmm. And we are still good at, at doing that. But that was, she would create things that would seem like fun, but they were really, she was educating us. Mm -hmm. She had, she believed that no one should be basically left behind. That some kids might have needed more than others in order to have their developmental skills met. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So she was interested in each individual child. And what always surprised me about mom was that she could remember so much about each child. She taught thousands of kids and they'd come up to Miss Luke and she would know their name or so and or something about them. Wow. Um <clears throat> can you how old were you when you became aware of civil rights happening? Probably about six or seven. Okay. And how did you learn about? Well, you see, when mom was out to Dungy, she wrote a play, Brother President, which was the story of Martin Luther King Jr. and the civil rights movement in Montgomery. And when she wrote this play, the students at Dungy participated in creating a play. Mm -hmm. The head of the youth department of the NACP, Herb Wright, came to Oklahoma City and, and was at the play. And he wanted her to bring the play to the National Convention of the NACP. And she was so excited. But he only wanted her to bring one student. And she said, no. He said, the only way I would bring that play to New York City is that all the students that participated would have an opportunity to go. And so you have to realize that most of the students in the Dungy area, Spencer, Green Pastures, or whatever you want to call it, a lot of them never had the opportunity to even come to Oklahoma City, let alone go out of the state of Oklahoma. So it was a big deal. And they raised money, and the community raised money, and they sold pickles and popsicles and everything else so that the kids could go, that we could go to New York City. And I believe that Mom was the a Harriet Tubman. Mm -hmm. Well, she could decide it. Okay. What we're going to do is this. She got a map and it said, we're going to go the northern road. And we did. And for the first time in our lives, we had an opportunity to go into a restaurant and sit down and eat. Sit down and drink a Coke in a restaurant. See, let me backtrack a little bit. When I was a child, you could go downtown and spend all your money. But when you got hungry, you had to go behind the places and, and eat out of brown paper sack. You could not go in there and sit down and eat. It was color this, color white that, color this, white that, bathroom, telephone booths, name it. 
it was segregated to that extent. So we grew up in a segregated society and believed that that's the way it was. All over the world, it was segregated. Mm -hmm. We couldn't even go downtown and try on shoes. My grandmother would measure our feet and go down with a string and go downtown and take the string down there to buy our shoes. Couldn't try on clothes. You could buy all the clothes you wanted to, but you couldn't dry them on. So we went to New York City. And it's said that a little bit of freedom is a dangerous thing. <laughs> and we enjoyed that. We enjoyed having the opportunity to go into a restaurant. Even as a kid, I can remember. And sit down and eat and drink a Coke, just like everybody else. We went to New York City and we put on that play and we did the best that we could and we did a well of a job. Everybody was proud of us. But then it was time to come home. And we came back home, the Southern Road, to face the age of segregation and discrimination. Colored signs here, white signs there. You can't eat in here, you can't do this, you can't because of the fact, just because of the fact that we, our skin was black. So we came back to Oklahoma City. We had more segregated laws than any other state in the Union here in Oklahoma. We said, oh no, 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 no. We enjoyed that in New York. Let's, let's, why can't we go and sit down and eat in a place? We spent our money. So we started negotiating with the people in downtown Oklahoma City. They said that we would ruin all their businesses if they would allow blacks to come in and eat. And the negotiations lasted almost a couple of years. And one night at the NACP Youth Council meeting over to my mom's house, I made the motion that we would go and sit down at Cat's Drug Store and sit there and sit there until they served us. And that's what we did. So you were the spark for the sit-in. I don't know if I was the spark, but my brother and I got in a big argument over that. Because he said, well, we're going to have to sit down there and all the way for us to eat. And I said, how, how else can we do it, you know, as a child? How old were you at this point? Shoot, I don't know. Let's see, probably nine years old, somewhere wow. like that. So 13 of us went down to catch drugstore with our advisors. And we sat down. Do you remember who your advisors were? Mom. Fort Wood Williams drove one of the cars that went down there. And I, I don't, it was not many adults that went down there with us okay. that night on the first night. It was just 13 of us. It was actually 14, but the 14th person did not go into cats. And we went in and the people were just shocked. And they were mean. What are you doing in here? Why would you have the audacity to think that you could come in and sit down at this lunch counter? But we did. Mm -hmm. And we sat and we sat, and we sat. All over the town, we sat. Until the doors of segregation and discrimination started falling down. When it hit the drugstore, a little while later, they decided nationally to open up all their stores to blacks. And they did that. 52 stores across the nation because of what we did here in Oklahoma City. 
Can you talk about what it felt for you guys to take the Northern route and have that freedom to sit and enjoy a coat? And then coming back down to Oklahoma and realizing that segregation wasn't something nationally. What did it feel like for you as a nine-year-old girl? It felt good. There's a feeling that it's hard to express. I felt good on the inside. Because I thought segregation was, the whole world was segregated. I didn't know that blacks were treated differently. Yeah. So then coming back south, what was that? What was that? What did that feel like? Injustice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hell. You got tired of going to the dirty bathrooms, the waterless water fountains, sitting in the back of places that you were going to, demeaning to your whole system, the injustices of being treated differently only because of the color of your skin. How you gonna feel inside? You feel like a nothing, a nobody. Yeah. So when you were sitting and you say that they were hateful, like, can you kind of talk about? Oh, spitting on you, wasting thumping coffee on you, kicking you. And you guys were children. And we were children. But, you have to understand about the city of movement. And I didn't understand it then, but I understand it better by and by. That they trained us to be nonviolent. They trained us to turn the other cheek. To be kind to those that tried to misuse us. They used the Gandhi. Mom would teach us about Gandhi and how Gandhi reacted. They she would teach us about Martin Luther King. She would teach us about love. And she always would say, must I love my enemy? And the answer to that question is yes, because it's your brother. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I had a chimpanzee thrown on me. And you were nine years old at this time, right? I, I was about 10 then. 10, okay. My, my mother went to jail 26 times. Wow. And it was not a lot of kids that uh, whose parents had money that participated in city ends. Uh, I would say socially well off, uh, economically, we had a lot of nothing. But what, what we did have was a lot of pride. Yeah. So when other kids were sitting in their homes on Saturday mornings looking at cartoons, we were out protesting. And protests we did. How did it feel being a child in the middle of this movement? That's a good question. The experience of it was something that if I had to trade in, I, I, I couldn't do it. Because it taught us stick to itness. It taught us courage. It taught us what Christianity was really about. You can't talk that talk when I walk in that walk. It ta taught us how to. It told us that well, if you can't take it, you need to go and go to the hardware store and buy some tough skin. Because surprisingly, life is not fair. And you cannot change the hearts of people by just doing nothing. We had to make them consciously aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. 
And the city movement just grew and grew and grew. Were you scared or nervous? Oh, I've been scared and nervous mm -hmm. at different times. Not always. I, when I was at Douglas, they had threatened to bomb the school. And the FBI came and got me out of school to take me to Dungy. And when we were on our way to Dungy, they almost had a wreck and kill me. <laughs> but that didn't happen. That was one frightening experience. Another frightening experience was when we were coming from a rally, a freedom rally, some whites followed us in their pickup truck and guns in the car. And if you knew my mom, she would not only drive, she would herd the car. And around the corner from us lived the Weldon Posey. And Barbara Posey was our spokesperson for the youth council during the uh, sit-ins. And my mom said, now listen, Calvin, listen, Marilyn. And I want you to do exactly what I'm telling you to do. When I turn this corner, I want you to, and I'm going to get as close to this porch as I can possibly get. And I want you to jump out of the car and run as fast as you can and just beat on the door and I'm going to be honking the horn for them to let you all in. So the closer we got to the house, I said, Mom, what are you going to do? She said, don't worry about me. You just do what I told you to do. So she turned that corner and we got out of that car and we started hollering and screaming and knocking on that door. And Mr. Mm. Posey was a big man and he came to the door and let us in. And I often wondered if my mom had not come back that night. Where would we have been? But I, it was, I think it's all in God's plan because I think he knew that that was going to happen. And it's, he said, Clara, it's not your time to go. So that was probably one of the most frightening things. Why did the FBI get you out of Douglas and take you to Dungy? Because they had threatened to bomb the school. But I'm, I mean, like, why did they skit you specifically? Because the, I was in the school. Okay. And they felt that, I don't know if they said, Marilyn, let's get rid of God. Yeah. No. Yeah, I'm just wondering if, like, the bomb threat was specifically because you were Clara's daughter or... Probably. Was, okay. Because I was the only one that they took out of school. Okay. Okay. And I, that's the only reason I could come up with. Yeah. But I know I was sure glad to see Dungy <laughs> that day. <laughs> so when you were in school, were, were schools still segregated? Yes. What was it like for you to be attending segregated schooling? What were your experiences like in these schools? <clears throat> I thought all schools were segregated. We had teachers that were interested in us. The schools were more community schools where you knew your teachers and either from your churches or organizations in the community. And they would, you couldn't do anything wrong with school because they would let your parents know before you get home from school. And I didn't know that we had a, supposedly had inferior education because of things that that they knew we knew too, mm -hmm. and some of us had to work harder than others in order to achieve certain goals, but we were able to do it. Right. Um, can you talk about like your mother's teaching? What you know about your mother as a teacher? She was hard. <laughs> That's why she was, 
Never done deal with the truth. <laughs> so I wouldn't have to go to class at the mom. But she was fair. She was a good teacher. She brought education to action. If she had had the legislature in her classroom with she had the House of Representatives and the Senate. She had the, the Speaker of the House. Things that so the kids could relate to it rather than just read about. Mm -hmm. And she continuously wrote a plays to get them about history, to get them involved. And she didn't believe that kids could not learn. And anything that you did for Clara Looper, you had to do it by memory. You couldn't be jabbing and take a paper and read it and say, I know this. If you know it, you wouldn't be reading it. You sit down and you can learn it. Mm -hmm. All kids can learn if you would take that time to do so. And don't tell me you can't learn. You haven't tried to learn. And you can sit down and learn this. Learn these timetables. Mm -hmm. This education is something that, that some people can get in a snap and it takes the other people snapping to get it. Mm -hmm. What did education mean for you during that time? And what did education mean for Clara um, to instill into her students? Like how, how important or unimportant was education? It was very important. My grandmother, my grandfather first, let me start with him, was a bus driver in Hoffman. And Grayson. And he was a dreamer. And I, I think that mom got a lot of her dreams from her father. Because he always dreamed of a better day for his kids. My grandmother was a day worker. And she moved to Nichols Hills to educate my mother and her sisters, taking care of other folks' kids and cleaning other folks' houses. So she had a deep-seated need for education. Mom loved to read. And she's the only person that I know in America they would read congressional records as a <laughs> hobby. I don't know anybody else that would read congressional <laughs> records. But that was one of her hobbies. She just enjoyed it. Mm -hmm. And she was a historian. Mm -hmm. She kept articles and, and current events that I'm sure glad that she did. I didn't realize the importance of doing that until after her death. Because she had, I gave her entire collection to the Oklahoma History Center. And she had so many things that, that we say, wow, this really happened. Mm -hmm. But by her being a history teacher, she realized the importance I'm doing so. Yeah. <clears throat> so you were obviously really young when you became aware like civil rights happening. Yes. Okay. Um, what did it mean for you to be so involved? During, and I thought everybody was supposed to be involved. <laughs> and it was a good thing. Mm hmm because I didn't realize that the Constitution said it was okay for us to do what we were doing. Right. But she would, she was drill us in history and, and drill us about black history because black history is American history and you can't know American history without knowing black history. You can't know black history not without knowing American. And she really believed that in her soul. Mm -hmm. And her white students would tell you, ooh, we. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. She made history a reality to her students. 
Why do you think history was so important for your mom? Because unless you know your history, you don't know where you're going. If you don't know where you've come from, you're not sure where you're going. If you know the struggle that we've gone through, then you can better understand where you're going. Can you talk a little bit about what you think led your mother to become um, involved? Yes. Mom's brother, and we were talking about it, mm -hmm. was mad because they would not treat him in the hospital because of the fact that his skin was black. That had a uh, impact on her that I think that that was one of the strongest motivating factors in her life. And then her father, who had gone to the war and come back, never had the opportunity to enjoy the real joys of America because of the segregated system. And he died in 19, I think it was 57, at VA hospital. I think that had an impact because he used to tell all the time, Clara, we're going to be free. And she said, Dad, well, when are we going to be free? And it was, I don't know when. I don't know how, but we are. Mm -hmm. And I think that she was like that little die heart battery when things were not going the way that she thought uh, uh, that they should go. And the people would talk about her. And during that time, it was not popular in the black community to be involved in the civil rights movement. It was not a popular thing. So she felt that heat from the black community and the white community, a lot of them hated her. So she had to be strong. People in the black community hated her? I, I don't think hate is the right word. But they did not want to associate with us. Really? Because of the fact of our involvement in the civil rights movement. Because a lot of them felt that we were infringing upon their, their jobs and their culture the way they know it. Mm -hmm. Hmm. It was not a popular thing to be associated with us during that time. Yeah. It's like not to disrupt the boat, well, mm -hmm. don't rock the boat too much. Hmm. Do you think your mom would accept the label of an activist? Oh, I'm sure she would. Mm -hmm. Because she'd never been satisfied with the status quo. Mm -hmm. She felt that we would have to, uh, she had to fight injustice and on all levels. And she did. Yeah. One thing um, in your mom's transcript, she said her first job at the deaf and blind school was probably her earliest demonstration because they had to have money taken out for the Democratic um, National Convention. She didn't think it was fair. So she stood up for that. She said, I don't want money coming out of my check for the Democratic National Convention. And she said that's probably her earliest act of <laughs> earliest demonstration <laughs> was back then. Um, so considering the fact that you were side by side with your mother, what was your understanding of her role in, in the civil rights movement in Oklahoma? Mom was a, not only the advisor, but a spokesperson also. And she was one of the few people that the reason that children were used was because they didn't have to worry about losing their jobs. 
And I, I know mom was concerned about losing her job, but it's not a major factor with her. Because at one time, they had contacted Reverend W.B. Parker to fire her. And they would promote him to be principal of Dungeon. If he would fire Clara Luper, that was the way he would get to be principal. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. Just things like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um. This is crazy. Were you ever scared for your mom? I mean, you talked about time. that one instance, but... All the time. Yeah. And not only... <clears throat> my mama was on the bridge in Selma. We were down there. I was in Chicago, and, and when Martin Luther King was killed, and the NACP sent us down to Memphis, and we got in the... Uh, as part of the leadership conference, we were attending. And when we got into Memphis, everybody had these white things around their heads. And I was thinking, I said, oh, I wonder what kind of organization this is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then only to find out that that's where the police had, had, had beat some of these people doing the right after King died. And the streets were quiet. And they had all kind of weapons on top of buildings and and tanks rolling down the street. Yeah, I've, 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 that's a scary moment. And this was in Memphis. Okay. Oklahoma City, we did not have the violence like they had all over the United States in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason why we did not have the violence is that the we had a mom had a relationship with the police department, and you know, hey, we're gonna take you to jail, Miss Luper. So okay, <laughs> <laughs> but not only that is that we were able to work together, whites, black, Jews. And she was saying, polka dots, we're going to all work together. Because she felt that the only way, the only way America could change would be working together. Because so goes one of us, so goes all of us. Mm -hmm. If you don't succeed, then I won't succeed. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that type of ideology is how Miss Looper was able to kind of get white supporters and white backing? Yes. So I, I, I was told a story about, I think it was John A. Brown, and it was the wife of John A. Brown who mm -hmm. hated her. And she was able to go from that to becoming a lifelong friend. Yes. How do you think your mom was able to foster a relationship like that with someone who started out hating her? I, I get cold chills in thinking about it. I think that people are trained to hate. And they hate you because they don't know you. And when Mrs. Brown had the opportunity to really know mama and get her involved in her life, she took that opportunity. And I never will forget when her, when the Zeta Phi Beta sorority honored her, there was the, the first flower that mom received her orchid was from Miss Johnny Brown's. Hmm. And she, Miss Johnny Brown's mom would tell the story that she was just a, a, a lonesome woman. Yeah. But she was a good woman. Mm -hmm. And after her husband died, she just left everything like it was. Yeah. Wow. How did your mom's involvement in the civil rights impact your family? My mother and father got a divorce. A lot of things that other kids 
would do or could do, we couldn't do, because we did not have the financial backing to do. And not only involved in the civil rights, but her students, she took an active role in her students. See, I can remember when a student of hers from Dungey would walk up here to Oklahoma City to her house and he would have cardboard in the bottom of his shoes. So you could participate with Mama Bam shoes, things like that. Mm -hmm. How did it impact us? It taught us a lot. It taught us what love was all about. Mm -hmm. And the students knew that that she loved them because she would always have the students around. And where she got, we didn't have no money. Where she got money to buy food for all these kids, I said, oh my God. But she could take nothing and make something. Out of it, and they would, and everybody would have a good time. Mm -hmm. Um, what were some challenges um, that your mother faced, or some challenges that you guys face as a family? I think most of the challenges were with her, and my brother could not handled it as well as I don't know if I handled it that well but people would talk about her. Yeah. Not of the good that she was doing but talk about her as a person. But she didn't let it bother her but he, he did. And I guess we did as kids because oh, Claire Lou going down there with all them kids and what she, why don't she just leave her? And he handled it differently. You know, it, it, it bothered him. Yeah. And it bothered me too. But I have a, a different perspective on it. And I did not let it become a part of the inner system in my soul. How do you think your mom was able to get such support from the parents of the children that she... They raised? believed in her. Mm -hmm. They believed in and they knew that she loved their kids. And she was a strong disciplinarian. She had what was known as a Board of Education, and everybody paid attention to the Board of Education because she didn't take a lot of foolishness. She believed that you could not teach a child unless that child was disciplined. So you had to learn how to listen. You had to learn how to be respectful. Yeah. And I can remember the time one of her White students from John Marshall got in trouble and was in down at the sheriff's office and they called her. They said, oh, what is he doing? What did he do? Tell you what, she talked to him and said, I tell you, you, you walk over to my house. I'm not coming down there to get you. Anybody get themselves in a situation like this. And that guy came over to get the Board of Education. And I told him, I said, I never seen nobody in my life that walked 20 miles to come over and get the Board of Education. <laughs> but I I saw him when mom died, and he said that was the greatest thing that ever happened to him. That that changed his life completely. Mm -hmm. But she didn't play with it. She said, You're not going to end up being nothing, you're going to be somebody. Mm -hmm. And the Board of Education is a paddle, I'm assuming. Yes. <laughs> That's clever play on words right there. <laughs> what did it mean for you to have, I mean, your living room was the site for the youth council meetings, right? Mm -hmm. What did that mean for you? Like, 
It's me Marion. Yeah. And it was funny because when Charles Heston came to Oklahoma City and led one of the demonstrations with Dr. West and, and some other leaders, they were over to our house. We thought our house was a mansion, although you could see right through it. <laughs> he had a camera. He left his camera over to our house. And I know that his camera cost more than our house. <laughs> but it was a house that was full of joy mm -hmm. and full of love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And full of kids. <laughs> Always. Um, what do you want people to know or remember about your mom? What do I want them to remember about my mom? Is that I think that God placed her in the situation that he placed her in because he knew that she could handle it. And that he would be with her in spite of everything that happened to her. Yeah. She would get up, stand up, speak up, and walk up. Mm -hmm. And she always taught the kids to to walk like you're going somewhere. Walk like you have a million dollars in your pocket. You might have a penny, but nobody needs to know that. Mm -hmm. Don't act poor. Don't dress poor. Mm -hmm. Be clean. And she looked at them as diamonds. She worked with the Miss Black Oklahoma pageant for years, developing young ladies to the fullest capacity. And as you travel all over the United States, you run into her students that she's trained as. And I think that that's one of the things that she's most proud of, the impact that she had on young people. When she got sick, one of her students set up a telephone call with 300 and some students on it. Wow. They just, they believed in her and she believed in them. And there's nothing that you could not do. And she would always tell us that nobody is smarter than you are. They just prepare themselves better. Yeah. So if you want to be smart, prepare yourself. If you want to be dumb, don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. And she is, she was, she was something else. A funny story I heard her say about getting arrested in Tulsa was the fact that she had just gotten her hair done and she got arrested and it was raining cats and dogs, she said. She told that officer, I'm not getting out of this car. I just got my hair done. <laughs> <laughs> and the officer was like, well, what do you want me to do? Your mom was like, go tell your boss. I'm not getting out of this car. <laughs> and she said the sheriff came out with a big black yeah. umbrella and walked her into the jail. <laughs> it just, it just, to me, that was just a moment of like, you're about to be thrown in jail, but you still stood your ground. Like, I just got my hair done. I'm not getting out. So you can take me if you want, but you're not messing up my hair. And it's just that type of, like, unapologeticness. Mm -hmm. So when you say she got arrested 26 times, like, what did, as a child, were you scared? Like, my mom's in jail. Like, no, you weren't? <laughs> Mama would say, don't worry about me. You worry about yourself. What yeah. are you doing to make America better? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't worry about me, Marilyn. I'm going to be okay. And she taught us. And it, it's something that I, I have continued to say in my mind. And I believe that this word she, that word she got a lot of her strength from. She would say that I believe in the sun when the sun does not shine. Mm -hmm. I believe in the rain when the rain doesn't fall. But I believe in a God that I've never seen. That's where she got her strength from. Wow. So, <clears throat> lastly, do you think your mom's work has impacted education today? Oh, way? yes. Most of her students are in education. Yeah. All over. They are involved with young people. Mm -hmm. Trying to train them. And I think that that's 
you, you see the fruits of her work through the young people that she contacted. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's why the Freedom Center will be vibrant again, because she spent time training kids from how to uh, the, the forks and things to use and meals. And if you don't go out to dinner, one of these days you're going to go out. <laughs> so you be prepared. Yeah. And, and you can always tell her students because they never say, oh, 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 mm -hmm. because she would not allow them to. Back again to the Board of Education. And she would make check marks. What can you do to improve yourself? Yeah. And give you a guideline to help you improve. Wow. So when you think of like all these, um, are you in education? No. Okay. No. I, I was, a, I was, I'm a retired all state insurance agent. Okay. I guess I was just going to say, like, thinking about all these different, like, womanist pedagogies and laboratory pedagogies and things like that, mm -hmm. that have been colonized by white educators. Mm -hmm. It's just, I just wonder how much that was already in Miss Looper's teaching. And now it's being colonized and called these things by white educators. But we kind of see evidence of it being used before, used before. Mm -hmm. yeah not just with your mom but like in a oh. lot of black teachers mm -hmm. when you talk about like womanist pedagogy and how they cared and things like that mm -hmm. and the interdisciplinary sense of like your mom is a history teacher but she her students can recall algebra facts and rules or typing in her history class so, mm -hmm. so the interdisciplinary instruction so that's um yeah her teachings definitely something to be theorized about. But. It, it's something about that generation because mom, Miss um, Fisher, Nancy Davis, Letty Rupon, all of them went to Langston at the same time. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered, I said, well, was it something in the water out there <laughs> at that particular time? Mm -hmm. Although their fights are very similar, they're very different. Exactly. But there was still a fight. Right. And there was still victories. Right. And I always wondered how that particular generation of women were so motivated. Well, that's what I wonder, too. That's what my dissertation is. <laughs> because, I mean, you're right. It's it's all, it's three women who are around the same time. They're all within these interconnected social systems. Mm -hmm. I mean, they went to college together. And um, even Miss Looper will talk about in her transcripts about her friend Ada Lois and mm -hmm. how her integrating OU is what, how she ended up in OU's graduate program. And then you think about Ada's uh, integrating and then Nancy at OSU. It's like, they're all in this interconnected system. And so getting to the root of like, what resonated with them to make such lasting impacts in the state. It's, it's interesting to dig Dig and I, I don't think they say that and say, okay, we're going to make a difference. Right. <laughs> no. Right. I think it happened. It didn't. Well, why did why did it happen? Yeah. Why did it happen and how and, did it become what it became? It was school. Mm -hmm. But she also, in her transcript, she talks about how important Langston was. Mm -hmm. And it was at Langston that they all felt this, like, Need. need to do something so it just wonder so it it almost makes you wonder and go back to Langston mm -hmm. and revisit what was happening at Langston during that time who were these professors you know who were their teachers before that that kind of instilled that fire so because when they left it's like they left Langston and just catapulted into these major movements mm -hmm. and it's just it's just so fascinating to me. And and it, all the while, what's even more interesting is interviewing their children. And they're like, I, they were just mom. Mm -hmm. Like, they were just mom to me. So these ordinary mothers who were just mom, who did these things, it's just, it's just, it's, I don't know. It's, it inspires me. Like, I don't, 
it's I become speechless about it sometimes because when you just really sit down and think about their impact, it's just it's so huge. So yeah, I don't know how to answer it. the question regarding them because I've asked myself the question yeah. a thousand times. Yeah. Well, I would love to get to the bottom of it. So I'm gonna well, be. If you do, let me know. I will. <laughs> I will. I promise. Is there anything else that you wanna leave us with? Yes. She referred to her students as diamonds, her diamonds. And she would tell us all the time that some diamonds are in the rough stages and they just needed to be shaped and and, and not step over. Yeah. So whatever you do, just don't assume anything about anybody. Get to know them. Help them cultivate. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for talking with me today. I really appreciate it. 